police officers, what's the dumbest thing you've ever seen a criminal do or say? In DUI trial, defendant chooses to represent herself. She tries to introduce evidence during the trial but is quickly blocked by the prosecution. The judge, maybe taking pity on the flaming train wreck that was this woman's defense, asks to see the evidence. It was a receipt from the bar she left before I stopped her that showed she had purchased two large margaritas. Her whole defense was, I couldn't have been drunk after only two margaritas. She was found guilty. My initial reason for stopping her was that she drove down an embankment on the side of the road to get to a McDonald's drive through Some absolutely flawless logic coming out here. The good old, I couldn't have been drunk, I only drank defense. Powerful. Story two. Retired cop here. One idiot move a guy did was he stole some poor girl's car. It was her first car. She worked full time. She was a sweet little thing and we felt so bad. She was crushed. Also in the car for some reason was her cell phone. So a colleague who has the gift of crap talking really well calls the number. Dude answers. It goes a little something like this. Cop. Mother fricker, you stole my girlfriend's car. The bad guy. Man, I'll screw you up and then screw your girl. Bring it, mother fricker. No cops, no friends. Me and you. I'm at the Chevron on Main Street and 5th. I'm calling your coward butt out. Man, I'm on my way. Me. No frickin' way he's coming. Dude rounded the corner and pulls into the gas station. We hid our cars behind it and then when he parked, we boxed him in. He had a gun too, frickin' idiot. On probation and had a loaded gun coming straight to us. Story 3. My brother is a Detroit cop. Told me this one. They get a call from someone reporting their car was stolen. They show up and it turns out someone had already stolen the tires off the car. Then a different group stole the actual car. They pushed it two blocks without tires and left perfect grooves in the street all the way to their garage. Their defense was, but we didn't steal the tires. Detroit, when we rob you, we really rob you. Story 4. My boyfriend is a police officer. Last week he pulled over a drunk driver who ended up speeding off. Car chased back to his house and drunk guy tells him, I got home. It's okay. You can go now. Drunk guy continues arguing and it's 3 a.m. So his family wakes up and his son steps out to the front porch and yells, Damn it, dad, you freaking idiot. We told you to stop doing this. Okay, genuinely feel a bit bad for this guy though. Like I hate drunk drivers, don't get me wrong, but this guy clearly has a problem if his family is aware and has told him to stop. So therefore, kind of sad. Story five, not a cop, but a corrections officer. Two inmates got into a fight in a hallway. I was the closest to them and only saw the start of the fight out of the corner of my eye. In my report, I wrote that I saw two inmates fall to the ground with name on top of other inmate. Later, the hearing sergeant was reading the report to one of the inmates. This was so they can dispute any facts in the report they felt were untrue or biased. He asked the inmate if they wanted to dispute any facts in my record. The inmate said, Yeah, we didn't fall to the ground. I grabbed the other inmate and slammed his butt on the floor. What would have been a simple fighting charge turned into an assault charge. Story 6. My grandpa was a cop. He told me a story about how when he was still in uniform filling up his squad car, someone tried to rob him with a knife. Needless to say, that did not work out for him. Edit. Some people were a bit confused. My grandpa just pulled his gun and arrested the man. Sorry for the confusion. Apparently went something like this. Give me your wallet. What? Give me your wallet. Are you sure you want to do that? Yeah, now hand it over. Okay. Pulls gun out. You're under arrest. Robber. Shocked Pikachu face. I wonder what was going through this guy's mind when he decided to make this decision. Because some people might do it to, like, try to get arrested. It doesn't sound like that was the goal here. This guy just seemed genuinely baffled when he got arrested. Of course, I wasn't there, so I can't tell for sure, but still. Weird story. Story 7. Arrested a guy for shooting drugs in the parents' room of a shopping center. Walked in while he had the needle in his arm. We stare at each other for a bit, then he comes out with, uh, I'm, a uh, diabetic? I cuff him and leave my partner to do the search while I read caution and rights. Old mate is not diabetic. And we know this because he's got 87 prior convictions for use slash possession slash trafficking drugs. I go through the usual you don't have to say or do anything spiel and then say, do you understand these rights? He's totally cooked on drugs at this point and just looks at me and says, you want to get dinner tonight? It's not the worst response I've had to caution and rights though. Ah, the quick thinking diabetic defense. Great work, man. Great work. Seriously though, I hope this guy gets help and gets clean, but after that many convictions? The odds aren't great, I'll admit. Story 8. I had a friend back in the day that earned the name DUI Don because he was driving a girl home after some partying one night and she was absolutely hammered. He was just high as balls. He gets pulled over. He could easily say that he's sober, happy to blow into the tube, etc. and get out of it. First thing he says to the cop is, I'm gonna level with you. I'm really high. 
spent that night in jail. The cherry on this and the reason I know the full details of it all is because the girl with him was 17 and, bonus, homeless. When she didn't have anywhere else to go, she gave them my address, an 18-year-old living alone, and I got to become her temporary legal guardian. Awesome night. Thanks, DUI Dawn. I feel like this is a decent time to point out that driving high is also driving while impaired. Maybe back in the day they didn't have the same stipulation in the law, but like, I don't know. You shouldn't do it, man. It's not safe. Story 9. Woman is waiting for her DUI trial in the courtroom. The lawyers and judge are milling around and getting their paperwork in order. Trial starts in 10 to 15 minutes. The prosecuting attorney asks her if she wants to take the plea deal one last time. She refuses and goes on about how this is unconstitutional and the police and courts are corrupt and how she's going to take her kid to school, blah, blah, blah. She's starting to cause a bit of a scene. Yelling, acting like a child, just being generally annoying. Someone in the room gets a whiff of alcohol. She is out on bond, so she can basically be given a PBT at any time for any reason. Judge orders one on her. She registers a point two two six in court. This woman who's on trial for a DUI had the audacity to drive to court drunk and then moan and groan about how she isn't being treated fairly and we're all corrupt and this is unconstitutional. Not only that, but it explicitly states in your bond conditions that you cannot consume alcohol. So I cuff her and bring her to the jail. She's still running her mouth during the walkover. I had nothing to say. I had absolutely zero sympathy for her. I could barely hold in my laughter on the walkover to the jail. All I gotta say is that poor, poor kid. Once again, another person that I hope can get help for their issues. Like, yeah, clearly she has a problem. And yes, it is a stupid thing to do. But like, I don't want people to make these kinds of decisions and be stupid like this. I want people to be smarter and better and give good lives to their children's. Did I just say children's? I meant children. Story 10. In a city near to me, a guy murdered a woman and put her body in a large garment bag and then left her in a vacant lot. Unfortunately for him, he forgot to take off the tags with his name and address from a recent flight. A would-be bank robber wrote his hold-up note and put it into his wallet. He got rattled at the bank and accidentally left his driver's license on the counter when he handed the note to a teller. A third crook just took on more than he could handle, and apparently didn't watch the time. He had a long history of Grand Theft Auto and was hospitalized after being badly beaten in the parking lot of a sports area after a lacrosse game. The guy swore up and down he had no idea why anyone would assault him there. Now these are prime stupid criminal things. Identifying yourself at the scene of the crime incredible doing that for a murder and a bank robbery double incredible you people are the special breeds of just foolish story 11 dad's a detective had a murder case where a dog walker found a severed head in a park over the rest of the morning they found a full set of chopped up body parts around that park a trail of blood led from each part and they followed them all the way back to a nearby house in through the door and up the stairs to a room covered in blood with a guy asleep in a bed Turns out this guy had gotten drunk with a friend, had an argument, ended him, chopped him up, and hid his body parts in the park before passing out at the house. Police literally caught him red-handed. Apparently he was confused as to how they got to him so quickly. Story 12. So my personal favorite was when a dude on a motorbike swerved in front of our squad car and crashed. We hopped out, picked the bike off of him, it was pinning his leg, and asked, You alright, mate? To which he replied, Of course I'm alright, what do you mean? Uh, well, you just fell off your bike. No, I didn't. He just kept insisting there was no way he could have crashed, and it must have been someone else. Edit for those concerned it was a head injury. He did blow a 0.17 when we tested, so we chalked it up to that. There are many ways to try to avoid getting arrested. Gaslighting the cops is probably not one of them. They were right there, and they watched it happen. Good try, though. Story 13. Not a police officer, but a witness to a crime who had to give evidence in court. Basically witnessed a girl crashing her car and barrel rolling it into a tree. She was clearly drunk. The fireman arrived after 10 minutes. Her car had leaked petrol everywhere. Then her husband shows up on foot and tries to calm her down, followed by her mother in a car and the police. She tried to claim that she wasn't the one driving, even though no one else was in the car. In court a year later, she said her mother had been driving, the one who showed up in her own car 10 minutes after the crash. She also punched an officer in the face and was pepper sprayed, but that's a whole other story. Needless to say, she was found guilty. Story 14. Not a cop, but rode along frequently as part of a training program. The dumbest thing I saw someone do involved one of those dog crates that you can carry, like for a small dog like a chihuahua. This woman was having a dispute with some people who had their dog in one of those carry kennels sitting on the ground. There were three officers at the scene. The woman was given a ticket and tossed it on the ground. She was told to pick that up or you will be arrested for littering. 
When she picked it up, she kicked the dog kennel hard enough to make it barrel roll. She was immediately and aggressively taken into custody and charged with animal cruelty. Story 15. In law enforcement, but not a regular cop. Middle of search warrant looking for a bloke. Lots of drug convictions in the past. Found a still-burning blunt in the ashtray in the living room, but no signs of the guy. I am 99% sure he's in the roof cavity. I announced to my partner, I think he's up there. Should we look? Suddenly, the ceiling starts talking. Hear the softest... No. <laughs> Crap. Can they hear me? No, no, it's all good. So my partner says, Nah, man. I didn't hear that guy say we shouldn't look up there. Ceiling replies with, Sweet. I knew they wouldn't find me. Needless to say, we looked and pulled a very, very stoned guy out from under the insulation bats. Side note, they make you itchy as hell. So be careful choosing your hiding spots when you're stoned. Story 16. There are so many to choose from, but this one sticks out. Dude decides that his fake dong no longer does the trick. So he uses his creative liberty to construct an apparatus to, uh, enhance his experience experience. He takes his once boring old fake dong and bolts it in an upright position on the top of his nightstand, and creates the Megatron of frisky toys. Unfortunately for him and us, he found himself unable to disengage from his new toy. Evidently, the once pleasurable toy was now a torture device, because his screams of agony were alarming and loud enough to get the attention of his neighbor who called 911. After 10 minutes of unsuccessful attempts by police and EMS to remove homeboy from his device, we ultimately had to unbolt the toy from the nightstand and transport him to the hospital with the toy still intact. This one is unfair. This isn't a criminal. This is just a man who did a very, very, very silly thing. I'm having trouble imagining exactly what happened or like what this means, but uh, I don't think I want to spend too much time trying to picture it. So moving on. Story 17. Friend who's an officer told me this one a bit ago. He was driving near where a known car thief lived, so he stops by. SUV in the driveway with no tags. Walks up, runs the VIN, stolen. Now the property had a house on it, and then out back, a small mother-in-law suite where said thief lived. Officer walks out back, knocks, and then hears a car door. Officer starts running, engine starts, and yep, thief is driving away in the stolen SUV. Officer knows where he ditches stolen cars at, so has an officer stake out that area. Sure enough, two hours later, the SUV rolls up with a Jeep following it. SUV driver wipes down the dash, wipes down the outside door handle, and gets in the Jeep. Officer pulls them over and arrests them both. Why both? Well, the Jeep is also stolen. Officer runs her license, sends in another officer to her address, and guess what? She had a stolen car at her place too. Three stolen cars recovered, two people in jail, all because one officer decided to stop by a thief's last address. Story 18. My brother-in-law is a cop in a small town. Pulled over a car one night and recognized the kid. Smelled weed inside the car and said, Give me the weed and I won't search your car. I won't give you a ticket, you can just be on your way. Kid fights him, says, He doesn't know what that smell is, there's no weed. And, of course, How can I trust you that you won't take me to the station if I give it to you? Brother-in-law promises again if he hands him the weed, he will let him go, no questions asked. Kid keeps being a moron. Brother-in-law searches the car and finds many, 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 many more drugs hidden all over as well as weed. Brother-in-law says, all right, let's go to the station. Kid gets upset and says, you say you weren't gonna do this, see, I couldn't trust you. I groan and laugh every time I think of that. What a dummy. A bit of a dummy in that he probably should have done it if he had much more incriminating stuff in his car, but not a dummy fully for the reasoning, in my opinion, because it's true. Cops don't have to keep their promises. That's not in their code or whatever. OP's brother-in-law absolutely could have taken the weed and then booked the kid. Like, that is fully within his rights, I guess, as an officer, which I will say... I don't love, but eh, it is what it is. But assuming the kid had, like, hard drugs in there that could really catch him serious possession charges, yeah, that's foolish. Story 19. I was in the police at the time. In the middle of the night, my partner and I found a car in a cemetery. Stolen cars were being dumped there regularly. The car had its windows down, and it had only recently been left there. It was still warm to the touch. It didn't flag up as stolen, and through the window I could see a hard drug pipe in plain view. That gives us the ability to search the car. Inside we find a bunch of pipes, three and a half grams of hard drugs, a small amount of weed, and a handgun. There was also a tablet slash phone that was unlocked. And while we were searching the car, the tablet kept on receiving messages from people trying to score drugs. I had a quick look through the phone and was able to figure out that the owner of the car had come out from the city. I worked rurally at the time, and they were looking to score from one of the local gangs. But the gang didn't want her turning up, so arranged to meet her at the cemetery and conduct business somewhere else. I leave a business card under the wipers. Not my card, but the station's. On the back, I wrote that she, the owner of the car, should come down to the station if she wants to get her stuff back. And sure enough, she did. At nine the next morning, absolutely high out of her mind, 
looking for her drugs and gun. Story 20. Not my story, but my police officer friends. He had gone in to arrest someone for dealing drugs. He was in full uniform, whilst someone else had already been there undercover. The drug dealer looks at the undercover police officer and says, y You're undercover! Yes, well done. He looks at my uniformed friend and says, y You're undercover too! No. Then he looks at someone else, not a police officer, and says, and you! Guy responds with, How am I an undercover police officer? I just bought drugs off you. And that's how they made an unexpected arrest that raid. All that guy had to do was just say nothing. All he had to do. You were so close to getting away with it. So, so close. I will say, it is hilarious that the guy's like, You're an undercover cop at the uniformed officer. That is hysterical. Story 21. So we are partying at one of our friend's places, and the cops stop by to check, What's with all the commotion? I know that because they told me that there weren't any complaints or anything. So I'm dealing with the cops when my friend, who is high as balls, decides to join in. He starts speaking in our native tongues, which the cops don't understand. Anyhow, one of the cops raises his right hand and waves three fingers in front of my friend's face, asking him, How many fingers is this? To which my friend replies, still in our native language, thankfully, Why do you drink so much that you are even unable to count your own fingers, sir? So even in his high mind, what did OP's friend think he was doing here? Was he going to arrest the cop? Was he calling the cop out for being drunk on the job? What, what was the plan? I mean, if he was really high, the answer is there wasn't a plan, I guess, but I feel like even high thinking has some logic behind it, right? It might be flawed, but there's logic. Admittedly, I have not been high myself, but I just feel like your brain would still kind of work, just not all the way there, you know? Maybe I'm wrong. Story 14. This happened in January. Guy was straight out of jail two years, and of course at that point his marriage was rocky as hell. When his wife dropped his kids off to visit, he lived with his parents for parole purposes. The son said his uncle hit him. The father then filed a PFA against the wife and uncle. It was granted. Then he files for sole custody. It was granted. The kids were in his custody for about two months before the custody hearing. Of course, my boss threw me the file and I had to handle the mediation and last minute prep. At mediation, the father and wife sit angry-eyed. Literally, cross-armed and furious. The other lawyer and I discuss the facts and what arrangement each client wants briefly in another room. We come out and our clients are gone. Magically and praise the lord, in the course of ten minutes of me and the lawyer talking, the father and mother made up, made out in the corner of the hallway, and returned. The case was dropped. May I mention this was pro bono? Story 15. My first job out of law school was as a trial court staff attorney. This basically is a judicial law clerk. So we did a lot of research and advisory memos for judges. I didn't cover family law docket, but my office mate did. She got an emergency motion in a family law case one time. For the non-lawyers, these are filed when something is extremely time-sensitive and critically, like a matter of life and death, important. If the judge deems it a true emergency, your matter will be heard on an expedited basis. They'll fast-track you in for a hearing, usually in a matter of days, rather than the usual weeks or months it normally takes to get a hearing date. Anyhow, this particular emergency motion was to compel the ex-spouse to send their child to Happy Faces Daycare, because if the child couldn't go to Happy Faces Daycare, it was going to be irreparably damaged from lack of social exposure, etc. Emergency daycare. Needless to say, this was not an emergency. I don't know how the motion was ultimately ruled on other than that it was not an emergency. Story 16. I have seen some extreme pettiness, but the best story I have is actually from my guardian ad litem professor. When she was practicing, she had a client whose ex-wife was super duper specific about getting all of the children's clothes back from his house when she got the kids back from him. Like, if one sock was left behind, all hell would break loose. So this guy's solution was to make the children strip naked in the foyer and put on clothes specifically worn at his place when it was his turn to have them. Then when they went back to mom's, they would have to strip naked again and change back into the clothes she sent them there in. Now this is a ridiculous rule, obviously. Was it handled in the best way by the father? Uh, who's to say? Surely there must have been something else he could have done. But the rule is insane. Or at least how strictly it was enforced, I guess. Story 17. Canadian family lawyer here. Many instances of pettiness. Generally, good family lawyers will call their client on their BS. We don't want to be the lawyer standing in front of a judge over really petty things. Reputation is important. Client. My son is very mature for his age. I believe access to his mother should be per his discretion. Me. Your two-year-old son? That said, I've had people call my office yelling that my client wouldn't allow them to pick up the infant child at 10 p.m., only four hours late for a visit. One guy fired two previous lawyers and retained me to negotiate adding three meaningless words to a settlement. We're talking months of intense negotiations between counsel. One parent refusing to allow another parent to take kids on vacation because they wanted to take the child to Disney first, despite, 
you know, not having the funds to do so, and stuff like that. The most petty are the parents who phone CAS, Child Protection Services, or the police for every minor disagreement. Your two-year-old cries when you're leaving home? Call Child Protective Services! Story 18. This happened to an attorney at the law firm I work for. Husband and wife fighting for custody of two children after bitter, ugly divorce. Wife made an account in the husband's name on Ashley Madison to try and show his infidelity in a way that could be presented in court. Husband responded by putting some kind of pesticide in all of the wife's shampoos and conditioners, causing her hair to thin and fall out like she had been picking it. Wife and her new lover, the youth pastor at their church, claimed husband had touched a girl at their church, and the girl had told the youth pastor. Husband convinced one of their kids to say the mom had been starving the kids as punishment. Wife has youth pastor light husband's car on fire. Last but not least, the original cause for the divorce. Husband banged an escort, caught an STD, and gave it to the wife. Wife got custody in the end, and husband moved to Central America. I am begging whatever divine powers may be that this child somehow turns out all right. Neither of these parents seem like an excellent choice here. I don't know if the word pettiness even scratches the surface here. I felt like with every new thing I read, I was like, more on the husband's side and then the wife's side and then the husband's side because it's just everything they did was insane. So I've landed on neither side. This child needs help from someone who is not their parents. Story 19. Not the most petty, but one I remember. I had a client who negotiated to keep the marital home, but had to make a 40k payment to her spouse as part of the deal. I scheduled a meeting in my office to be joined by my client, the adversary, ex-spouse, and opposing counsel. I confirmed with her repeatedly that she was coming to the meeting, and confirmed with her repeatedly that she was bringing a bank or cashier's check for the amount, as specifically directed in the property settlement agreement. Day comes and she's running late. We're sitting around my conference table passing time. A bunch of guys knock on the door to the conference room. They looked like they were movers from the way they were dressed. They walk in carrying duffel bags which they set down on my table. Lots and lots and lots of duffel bags. She had taken out the money in singles. Opposing counsel was understandably livid. I informed my client I would no longer be representing her. In the movie world, this is an incredible own. In real life, you've just made a lot of people's lives much harder. Some of those people were on your side before. After this, not so much. Story 20. Family law attorney here, aka glorified babysitter. Let's see. One client said that father's visitation should be limited because his girlfriend's shirts are too low cut. Another client was ordered to box up his wife's belongings and some of the child's belongings and hand it over to her. She had him arrested and moved out. When I followed up with him, he said all went smoothly. Did as the judge directed. When we get to court, opposing counsel informs the judge with color photographs that he boxed up garbage. Literally took garbage and stuffed each box with it. When I asked why he did that, he said, My wife only owned garbage. That's what she left behind. Same client, who was actually the worst I've ever had, once threatened to call Child Protective Services and alleged that the mother was neglecting and mistreating their daughter. The problem was that there was a full stay-away criminal court order of protection against him, in favor of the mom and child. I told him that if CPS deems it to be true, his daughter might end up with the state. His response? Then so be it. Let her go to frickin' foster care. Same guy used to whisper drop dead every time his wife walked by us in court. Now, we don't hear anything that the wife did, so she might be petty too, but from what we know, this man sounds insufferable. Not only did he do something to get arrested and kicked out, he also just sounds like a piece of garbage on top of that. Like, you can be arrested and still be a decent person. There are ways that can happen. This does not sound like one of those cases. Story 21. Friends of mine divorced and dad went a little overboard. There was dad's house stuff and mom's house stuff. When the two boys would go to dad's, they would have to strip down naked just inside the front door, stuff all their mom's house clothes in their backpacks, and don dad's house clothes. Dad would then take the backpacks out to the shed where they would stay for the duration of the visit. There was nothing from mom's house allowed in dad's house at all, and the backpacks were completely off limits. At the end of visitation, dad would retrieve the backpacks, the kids would again strip naked, reclothe themselves in mom's house clothes, and then go back to mom's. Before mom caught on and sent them with a change of clothes, they would have to reattire themselves in the same dirty socks and underwear they wore on the way in. Everything was duplicated. There was dad's house and mom's house's bikes, 
Video games, clothes, everything. One day dad called mom screaming and irate because Adam was reading a book at a mom's house and he was really into it. Dad was upset because he had to go out and buy a copy of the book. How dare mom buy anything for her son without running it past him first. Also that he could buy a duplicate. The kids would be interrogated every visit. What does mom feed them? Which TV shows were they allowed to watch? What did mom do with you last weekend? You went to a movie? Get in the car, we're going to a movie too. He was really mad at the courts. She was a stay-at-home mom during the marriage, and he gave up the house in lieu of alimony but kicked child support. After the divorce, she went back to her previous employer and reignited her career, bringing in a nice salary. He was a dentist and made partner in the practice. He applied to the court to lower his child support claiming that mom's significant income should change the equation. The courts agreed that the equation should change all right, seeing as he was making a bunch more money as partner, and so he should be paying more in support, so that backfired. All in all, he would take the pettiest little molehill and turn it into a mountain. Every time. I definitely thought the one where the children had to strip naked every time they got to the house was unique. Nope, there's two of them. Two stories with the same insane requirement. Although this one seems imposed by dad. The need to duplicate everything they do at mom's is, uh, unhealthy to say the least. With that kind of, um, I don't know what to call it. Peculiarity? Obsession in some ways? I can see why the marriage might not have worked out. Unfortunate about the whole child support thing, going to court and having to pay more. But he probably should have looked into the semantics of it before doing it, so that's, that's on him. Anyway, that is all the stories we have for today. I would like to thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day or night wherever you are, and I will see you in the next one.